Hello and welcome. My name is Irene Scott and I work for Internews. I'll be the moderator for this session, Decolonizing Information, Who Holds the Microphone? A small amount of housekeeping. We would love for you to be involved in this session with your questions and comments. So if you're feeling inspired, please do write your question in the chat tool that you'll see on the platform to the right of the screen and we'll try and fit in as many as we can as we move along. So thank you and hello to you wherever you might be joining us from today and let's get started. Information is power, and in a humanitarian context, information is not only power, it can be life-saving. Information is knowing how to access food and water, where to seek safe safety, how to reunite with your friends and family, and increasingly, information in itself is being recognised as a critical form of aid. But information channels are also an important accountability tool for us, allowing a community to ask questions, to contribute to the design, implementation and assessment of humanitarian services. But in the humanitarian system, information is held tightly, it's shared cautiously. We carefully craft messages that have been reviewed and approved by so many people that the end product is sanitized, distant from the reality of the community and the original question that they asked. We see the sector produce mountains of reports and research. Community members in crisis complain of survey fatigue as they're continually asked about their lives. But how much of that research or the analysis and findings are presented back to the community? How are they able to use this information to advocate for themselves? And despite being a vital source of information in many crisis contexts, local media is held at arm's length with journalists giving very little opportunity to genuinely understand and engage in the humanitarian response. So as the humanitarian system looks to decolonize, today our panel will discuss how we flip this top-down information ecosystem to empower crisis-affected communities to have the information they need to have a real influence on humanitarian response. Joining me today, I have a wonderful panel of Kayla Dimpas, who is the Program Manager for Media and Communications at Ideals. Ideals is a non-profit legal agency uh, based in the Philippines. She co-creates media solutions with crisis-affected communities to ensure that people are engaged, informed, and empowered to claim their rights. We also have Shan Cameron Bakir. She's a senior editorial officer at the International Rescue Committee. She oversees the signpost project Simay Bata, an interactive online platform that provides two-way communication on legal rights and protection issues, supporting vulnerable communities throughout Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan. And finally, Ida Yester, who is the Senior Health Media Advisor at Internews. She's an award-winning journalist herself, a media technical expert, and what keeps her very busy at the moment is supporting health journalists around the globe to connect them with the tools they need to report on the pandemic and to support the information needs of their communities. So welcome to you all and welcome to the panelists. I'm going to jump straight in with a question straight to Shan. We're, we're putting you on the line first. Communities in crisis crave information. I think that's something we can definitely all agree on. Do you think they're getting what they need from humanitarian respondents? Well, uh, hi to you. Uh, first, I, I I think that the information services is an uh, is an ongoing growth process that that is constantly developing. New methods are are coming up. So, it, humanitarian actors actually need to keep up with this growth and need to prioritize how information is is like is it supposed to be given to everyone equally and I, I and in my opinion that humanitarian actors can do better in information services and can provide much more um, uh, facilities in, in, in term of uh, empowering people with information information actually can be life-saving in 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 um, in, in uh, sorry in periods of crisis so I would say that it, it, it there is no excuse for humanitarian actors uh, with with a, with the progress of of um, serv services of information services, and with with the facilities that we have now, such as social media and and the application and online services that that can be easy to use to, uh, by everyone, and uh, we can empower people to have access to those um, to those platforms. In, in this way, like we we, we can we can uh, focus our our 
our uh, prioritization, let's say, about information and how, how it is important for us as humanitarian actors to, to uh, um, uh, how can I say, sorry, uh, how, uh, how can I say that uh, as a humanitarian actors, we can uh, actually empower people. We can give them the chance to to be to be to choose the, the, the humanitarian aid that they are receiving. We can give them a communication technology that that will will make them um, uh, empower them to 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 use multiple tools to, uh, multiple tools. Give give feedback. Give. Um, uh, 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 as well as using an assessment tools, survey tools. There are a lot of applications, social media platforms that can be um, um, relevant to, to information services. So I would say that it, in, in, in collecting and providing relevant information in humanitarian context is a bilateral process. Like the, that should be based on active listening and in, in participatory approach like using digital tools such as social media, digital survey apps, etc., have like this. This would have a big potential to facilitate the collection of big quality and big quantity of feedbacks and inputs from the communities. Like for example, in our project in in, in Iraq, let's say we have the community companies uh, gave free access to people in in vulnerable areas where they they have IDPs they in the camps and. Oh, in, 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 in return as a signpost project that the one that I'm, I'm running now, uh, we, we provide information that is critical to people in, in, in terms of returning to their original area and in terms of protection uh, concerns. Um, we, we try to engage with people so we can have their perception about what information that they will need in um, uh, legal procedures, legal uh, services, um, and, and of course, but not trying to provide legal consultation because, uh, and, and try to, to, to make all the services and, and around them uh, easy to access. So this, this is an example, and I would say that humanitarian actors can do better by, by uh, using the, social media and the, the future of, of information services. And so I, I think for most humanitarian organizations, they would say we are communicating. We are sending information to communities. We're sending them so much information. Um, do you think that there's somehow a disconnect between the questions that they're being asked from the community or perhaps the information gaps that are present in the community and the information that's coming from humanitarian responders? And if, if there is this gap, how do, we, how do we bridge it? How do we make sure that the information we're providing is what the community is actually asking for and not what we decide the community needs? And engaging with people and, and the two-way communication is, is, is the key. Like you, you have to give the uh, the community to express their feeling toward this information, their their needs, their uh, perception about what. Even if they if they just want to to uh, emphasize about about a specific um, uh, problem or or they want to complain, they want to uh, um, give give feedback about about specific service about specific um, um, uh, action have been taken in their area. So I would say that the key is in, in two-way communication, that not, not only uh, asking specific questions and taking back, but, but engaging and, and back and forth communication with them. That's why I was, I was uh, that's why I, I'm, I'm believing now that social media is the future of uh, information services, because it's the best way that give you this, this type of, of um, a space, the, this, uh, the, the huge space of people communication and people interaction, uh, people um, um, uh, exchanging their opinion, giving the, giving the chance to them to have a discussion between themselves and with us to, to um, model uh, the, the type of services they want. Do you, do you think, and I'll, I will move on to another panelist, but just on that point around the use of social media, though, um, I think we see a lot, especially in the COVID crisis at the moment, of organisations jumping into the use of social media and perhaps yeah. launching into social listening and gathering data from social uh, media to be able to inform their communication and their engagement activities. Uh, from my perspective, I don't see a lot of organisations that are actually engaging. They're, they're taking information from social media sitting in the boardroom and deciding what to do with it and then coming back and releasing communication products. So um, 
obviously your uh, organization and the project that you run is a very different model where you're engaging uh, as the questions are being asked and having discussions with people online. Do you see many other organizations taking that engagement approach? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I don't think uh, other organizations are taking this initiative and it's very important. I, I, I really think that it's, it's, it's going to have a, an amazing um, outcome if, if we try to focus on this. Have we, in our project, we have moderators that are talking to people through comments, through private messages, and even through a hotline um, a phone call. So we can give the space to, to audience, choose whatever they want. And also we try to model, model the, the post that we are creating or the content that we are creating so it, it will reach the, the targeted audience uh, specifically uh, but but I would not ignore the um, like the, um, the risk factors of using social media because social media can actually put people and 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 um, like can can make them exposed to exploitation exploitation or and, and threat and also it th that's why we have in, in our project um, a, a protection escalation protocol that that will try to that we can we we should try to control the the protection concern that might be um, related with social media. So um, yeah, I, I I agree with you. We need to focus on two way communication in social media. Ida, um, let let me go to you for a second because I think while some organizations might be a little bit terrified of engaging with communities directly via social media. Uh, some organizations are also quite terrified of engaging directly with local media. There's, there's quite a crossover there in, um, I guess, a, a lack of trust sometimes in the relationship. But there is a concept that's gained a bit of acceptance over recent years around this information is aid. Um, and if, if I was to really stretch that concept of information or communication as aid, does that make local media humanitarians? And, or do you think that they should play a larger role in humanitarian response? That's an excellent question. And it's actually something about which, you know, doctoral theses are written because I think, well, anyway, sorry. Hello, Irene, and hello to everybody. But it's just such a fascinating topic. I just wanted to dive right in um, and say that, I mean, honestly, it depends is part of the answer. Um, and both is another part of the answer because the position that media find themselves in during a pandemic or du during any crisis, or I should say that responsible media should find themselves in, is to be not always really certain how exactly to frame their stories. Because for instance, um, in the pandemic, um, there's a really fine line between crisis communication, risk communication, social and behavior change communication, and independent media sometimes, responsible independent media. There will always be a role for the media to be a watchdog, to be a watchdog of humanitarians, of governments, of even influential community members. That must always remain sacrosanct. But I really think that in a crisis like the COVID crisis, which is becoming a, obviously a very protracted global crisis, um, it would be completely irresponsible for media to not ensure that their messages align with the very carefully crafted message, uh, crafted messages of humanitarians, align with the best of science. Um, they can borrow from that carefully constructed language. I believe the humanitarian community is moving towards more of a social and behavior change approach as we miss a move out of that sort of extreme uh, version of crisis communication towards you know, social and behavior change. Many journalists, um, particularly journalists who had not covered health before, of which you know they're the majority, and they're all very much pivoted, or very many, very much pivoted towards COVID nineteen, with its many impacts, not only health and science impacts, but obviously in terms of governance and equity issues and so on. Bulk when they think of crisis communication, and when they when they sort of experience what they're experiencing, which is that you know to step back and to step forward for that matter, and help communities really kind of make sense of these different strands of communication does require of them at times to simply say, am I informing and am I playing a, a proactive and positive and non-confusing role in terms of conf um, informing those communities who listen to my radio show, who read my newspaper, who follow me on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's been a, a kind of crisis point for some journalists to absolutely own and acknowledge that. And then to be able at the same time to actually step back, in fact, be a critical 
watchdog voice, the fourth estate, somebody um, who, you know, a role that, that most media are more comfortable with, which is to sort of simply criticize, look with a critical eye um, at, at what they're seeing in front of them. But in a crisis like COVID with so much new information, I think it's irresponsible if they did only that, they should do a mix of the two. And it requires a lot of the media to actually to be able to accept and to embrace this dual role. And then immediately it requires a lot of the humanitarian community to also understand that the very same journalist who may be a watchdog of them, of their actions, for instance, in a refugee situation, in a particular crisis, uh, in a community experiencing crisis, that they're at once independent and at other times needing humanitarians for, you know, handholding, for sharing of best messages, for sharing of communication approaches, because it's ultimately about, you know, the question we're asking here is who's holding the microphone? Who are we holding it for? It's ultimately for people who need accurate information and who also need to know that there is a voice who speaks up for them if the providers of the information, the providers of aid, um, governments, etc., are not um, uh, are not really acting are not acting in their interest. I hope that answers the question, you know, about this complexity, complex role in which media find themselves. Oh, for sure, and and I think, like you said, that you know, that many PhD theses could could try and crack this nut, but it's 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 a really big question about how to, especially when we're talking about control of information. You know, there are there are many humanitarian agencies who might say we do work with local media. We have um, MOUs, we have partnerships, we create uh, radio programming, for instance, that we send to the radio station and they play for us, or we uh, create a public service announcement that they air for us. We do work with local media. Um, but there's quite often still that tone of uh, control around the message and perhaps still a little bit of a, a lack of trust in local media to be able to deliver that message in their own terms, in a, in a context um, and a, a form that makes sense to their community, of course, a language that makes sense um, and, and something that is recognisable to their listeners, you know, that doesn't sound like it was a perfectly crafted message um, from a boardroom somewhere. I should stop referring to boardrooms. None of us have boardrooms, let's be honest. Um, but <laughs> but how, how do we strike that balance of, of saying to humanitarian organisations, um, you know, it's okay to hand over some of the control to local media. Um, let's work on building trust and building capacity rather than um, trying to do their job for them. Because the media is there every single day and they have to tell a new story every single day and they have to, to be, uh, continue to be trusted in those communities and continue to be the voice of that community. So if they're the voice of the community, it cannot be this carefully crafted message. It can sometimes be questions around the message or a really fresh angle that you couldn't possibly have thought of if you're not in that situation yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, and a perfect segue to have a chat with Kayla as well. Kayla, your organization works um, in the Philippines, but, but especially in the Balm region of the Philippines, um, the Bangsamora region. Um, you work with uh, local radio stations and, and community radio stations to create media content with the crisis affected community. Um, there's not much more local than you can get than that. Um, so, so tell me about how that works in, and what role the community has in terms of um, deciding what information they need and, and filling that themselves. Okay, so I think that um, everyone here can agree that the voices of uh, crisis affected people should be amplified and, you know, resonate loudly, especially in spaces where decisions on their lives are being made. And there is no more effective way to respond to this than ensuring that they have one, access to, you know, accurate, relevant, and crucial information. Second, having a platform where they can represent their interests, their selves. And number three, that these platforms actually bridge them to their duty bearers. So what, we, uh, what our organization does and what as humanitarians, we should do is to ensure that we reach these people through platforms and ways that resonate with them. So with Sean, um, they use social media, digital platforms, and for AIDA, it's for television, newspapers, but for our communities in uh, the Bangsamoro, they really don't have access to strong internet connection, uh, mobile connectivity, and even mainstream media is too focused on national issues that they don't really report on the crisis. 
crisis there. So what really works for them is the use of community radios and further amplified by using public address systems and face-to-face -face, um, community conversations. So what we do is we tap local capacities. So we have local community patrollers. They are um, conflict-affected people themselves, um, internally displaced persons, and we... Um, we let them gather information on the ground, listen to what their communities are saying, what the top issues are, what the government should focus on, what humanitarian organizations should respond to. And then we capacitate them to report these issues through the community radios. Um, this helps because we want all the radio programs uh, to be community led and uh, aired through their local languages so that they can be able to you know, articulate their issues, speak more confidently, and not have anything uh, lost in translation. So um, working uh, all our years working with this community radios and our community patrollers, we really saw how they um, developed their sense of purpose, and then they're able to speak for themselves and represent themselves, which further contributed, you know, to um, fostering trust uh, with community members, with their duty bearers, and improving the social cohesion in their areas. I guess the thing is, when you hand the microphone to the community, and, and you know, when we're talking about control of information, sometimes they're going to ask questions that are uncomfortable for us um, and, and might, might not fit neatly into our messaging strategy. And sometimes they're going to um, explain things in a way that we don't feel is, is perfect. Um, so how do you deal with that, that challenge um, or, or the tug of wanting to have um, very carefully constructed messages, especially in a crisis and making sure that we, we get the information out there, but also allowing the community to do it in their own way that might not fit with the way that we might want to do it. I think what really worked for us is having this safe space where conversations um, can be had. And then um, people, everyone, our community patrollers, our community leaders, the, com uh, the traditional leaders, Muslim leaders, they can all just uh, throw their um, ideas and nobody will judge. And everyone will have a consensus on what we can do. And um, as a national organization, IDEOS is based in Manila, but we do have a uh, office in Mindanao. But really, um, what we focus on is not um, driving conversations or giving them technical communication strategies, um, none of those things. We do capacitate them, but if they do want to um, discuss this issue, then we need uh, that. Uh, then we need to respect how they want to discuss these issues because we are outsiders. Uh, they have their own context. And what we can do is just guide them to, you know, more um, to be more sensitive or to provide them with, as Sean said, um, communication tools, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, and I think that safe space is, is really interesting. And I did want to put that really quickly back to Ida as well, because um, one of the things that we've heard quite a lot of during COVID-19, we've been working in, you know, Internews has been working in many different countries and trying to build peer-to-peer -peer networks of local journalists and to ask them what they need to be able to report on this crisis accurately. Um, and one thing that seems to keep coming up is local journalists saying, um, you know, I call local health authorities or local organizations that run health activities and no one answers the phone or they answer the phone, but, but no one in that local office is available to talk to me and to give me background on the questions that I have. And how do we, is that something we also need to be developing a lot more between humanitarian organizations and local media? Is these safe spaces where, um, you know, I guess the silly question or the out, out of left field question or the um, any question can be asked um, and we can really work with the journalist to understand uh, the information rather than feeling every interaction is a media interview? Absolutely. I mean, this is really a moment to step out of that box when the only time we speak to each other is kind of on air or, you know, a, a day or two before, you know, as, as journalists asking humanitarians to appear on air, journalists make that mistake. They're busy people. It's they need to fill content. And um, it can happen in a crisis that one doesn't nurture the contact 
in the correct way, which is kind of to have ongoing conversations, to sometimes talk when you don't need them um, to appear on air. But, uh, but the same applies also to humanitarians, to not just view journalists as the conduit through which, or the channel on which the journalist operates, the conduit through which their message can be aired, amplified and broadcast. So it requires um, long range thinking for both parties. And it requires, you know, just very important and necessary thinking about planning and thinking through things rather than conducting life on air, conducting life um, live, when it is about such serious issues, such life threatening issues, and can also be about life affirming issues. If the messages are, if the relationship between humanitarians and journalists from both sides is really about figuring it out together, mutual respect and understanding that there is a reason why journalists contact you for a comment. It's because it can make a difference what is said on the radio, what is printed and what is amplified on social media or brought or, or, or reported for the first time on social media. It's amazing that journalists are really embracing trans media and vice versa, that non-traditional media people are producing contact content that is so important. So it really applies to absolutely everybody. But in terms of this humanitarian journalist relationship, um, it's a, the same applies also to relationships between scientists and journalists, where we encourage journalists to have science buddies, to check the science, where we encourage scientists to actually get to know journalists, to know who who is it that we can trust and actually reach out proactively to them? So in terms of the humanitarian community, this must happen. There is a really big global initiative on at the moment where Internews is a major role player, where we formed a media working group. And really the point of that working group is to actually let humanitarians know about needs from not just the capitals of the world, from all corners of the world, what the needs are of media. And one of the key needs that has come out of that recent, fairly recent infodemic conference that the WHO hosted in November, December, is that media need to know that humanitarians are there for them to brainstorm together about the stories that need to be done, to be available off air as well as on air. And I think that will really make a big difference. So it's not happening yet. It's something about which all of us need to continue advocating and we are doing so. And I have put up on the screen, if anyone's interested in continuing this discussion, uh, there are the contact details for all of the panelists, for Ida, for myself, for Kayla, for Shan. Um, I think this is, uh, I would say, a topic that we're all quite passionate about in our own work of making sure that um, when we look at the way that information and communication is managed in humanitarian crises, that we don't try and hold those I was going to say purse strings, we don't try and hold it too close to us, but we do use it to empower um, communities and we do make sure that that information sits with communities so that they can use it uh, to empower themselves as well. So thank you everyone uh, who's joined. We would love to continue the conversation. Do get in touch um, and we are we're happy to have a, a coffee and a chat at any stage. Um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the wonderful conference that's going for the rest of today and for tomorrow as well. So have a great day everyone. Thank you.